This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Ever since his undergraduate days at Princeton University, where I first had the uh, experience of knowing him, he's uh, had an unusual uh, commitment to uh, democracy and human rights, a commitment that involved uh, somehow uh, exploring the historical potentiality for realizing these uh, values, both in his own country and in the region and throughout the world. And he's sustained that commitment for all these years uh, since he left Princeton. He went to Stanford after that and uh, has a graduate degree there and now serves as a consulting uh, professor to uh, Stanford University. Uh, also, throughout this period, uh, Muli Hisham has consistently been a benefactor of the universities he's been attached to. He created at Princeton a center for the uh, trans-regional study of the contemporary Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia, which again was uh, rather prophetic in the sense that it was before, long before 9-11, and of course before the Arab Spring, yet it focused on that part of the world that is at the moment uh, the uh, crux of the historical drama that we're all experiencing in different ways. And he, at Stanford has been a benefactor in relation to uh, the, the uh, uh, study and promotion of de democracy and democratic values around the world. And I'm pleased to say here in Santa Barbara, he has uh, sufficiently bonded with our university to be the benefactor of a project on climate change, human security, and democracy. And so it is a great record of uh, personal involvement, uh, professional uh, engagement, and he plays a role, I think, uh, that allows him to comment on uh, the theme of, the, of his talk this evening, uh, responding to the Arab Spring, which he has, from the very beginning, through interviews and other expressions, shown a, uh, a, a deep uh, uh, affirmation and identification with uh, what the young people throughout his region uh, are aspiring to achieve. And so, he speaks to us. It's a privilege, I think, for us to have this opportunity uh, to hear from someone whose life and ideas are so uh, moving in such a consonant way with the way that history itself is unfolding. Let, join me in welcoming Prince Muli Hisham to our stage. My talk today is about, less about the repercussions of the Arab Spring and more about 
the trajectory of the Arab Spring, the dynamics of the Arab Spring, some tentative conclusions on probable outcomes, and a little an attempt of understanding where it's where this very important, uh, uh, very important phenomena we're seeing where where it might lead. And on this, I'd like to begin with a general overview. Uh, namely, that the, the, the early optimism, as you all know, of the Arab Spring has given way to a profound sense of caution and anxiety as we realize that at the end of the day, at the end of the road, democratization is no inevitability and that the future still remains very uncertain. But broadly, in the region, we see three patterns emerging in the new Arab world. First. There are states of transition in which politics may be transforming because previous autocratic rulers lost power and new social actors are asserting themselves and are challenging, challenging them in a successful way. And these countries, of course, are Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. The second category of states are states of conflicts in which incumbent regimes attempt to maintain power despite facing rising social violence and popular opposition. And of course, the category of states in this, in this category are Syria, Bahrain, and Yemen. Then you have other states of resilience in which old regimes have preserved power, either through carefully constructing uh, well-orchestrated and designed reform processes, or because no real mass opposition has come to challenge them frontally. And this includes Morocco, my country. It includes Jordan. It includes uh, other monarchies in the Gulf. And they're not only monarch monarchies in this category. Algeria is another example. But in virtually every state, however, we witness a distinctive change from the past. The old model of authoritarianism that traded political legitimacy for social and economic prosperity has become obsolete. In a word, this old pact that was stable is now fractured. Most regimes have lost its shell of old legitimacy, and citizens across the Arab world are more willing, more than ever, to question their governments, criticize their policies, and demand a voice in shaping uh, uh, the policies and the decision-making process. In a word, it's about accountability. And citizens demand it very vocally. However, as you've all witnessed, the loss of legitimacy does not necessarily translate into the loss of power. As we all know, only a few, uh, a few of these uh, leaders have essentially exited the scene. The general ten trend, rather, is that those regimes which remain, such as Syria, are using whatever means necessary to stay in power. And that ranges from coercion to resistance to outright violence against their citizens. And at the same time, we have witnessed an explosion of social forces that are articulating new voices in politics, most prominent of which are new youth movements, which are uh, independent and which are, in a sense, it's very new, unaffiliated to the traditional forces, whether on the left or traditional forces in the Islamist camp. To understand the future trajectory of the Arab world, we, must need, we need to understand all the relevant actors that are attempting to influence and to shape the new political landscape of the region. The first actor and the most insidious of these political forces is the deep state. And the term comes essentially from uh, uh, Egyptian activists, and they say in Arabic, the deep state. And you hear this in, in Egypt, and it, it's, it's a sense that there are forces which are still in continuity. So the deep state describes a set of underlying institutions and elites that have powerful stakes in the old political system and which struggle to control every political outcome, including democratic openings. In Egypt, the most instructive example here the deep state means not just the, the ruling Supreme Council of Armed Forces, or commonly known under the acronym of SCAF, but rather the larger 
silent military app apparatus that is aligned with the constellation or the web of security agencies themselves aligned to business elites. And though seldom exposed, exposed and though not necessarily a unified network, the deep state in Egypt has enormous economic and political stakes in maintaining the autocratic order run by former President Hosni Mubarak. The military, for instance, according to certain estimates, controls 35%, up to 35% of the Egyptian economy, thanks to its control of industrial projects, real estate assets, state companies. So any political change that requires transparency, or even minimally just cutbacks in the military spending, is for them an existential threat. And the actions of the military, or the Egyptian military, as we've all seen, do not bode well for democracy. We witnessed an unprecedented number of dissident arrests, growing intolerance with street protests, and finally, social violence, the climax of which was the, uh, 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 the repression against the Coptic clashes in Maspero in Egypt in October, last October. So it's not even a guess now, it's fairly, it's fairly safe to say that what the current military government in Egypt desires is what political scientists call competitive authoritarianism. In a word, said more casually, it's essentially a facade of democracy where a civilian government would be the facade or the, the showpiece of the new democratic order and where essentially behind it, the military would be, would be uh, pulling the strings. And under this competitive authoritarian arrangements, there are somewhat fair elections and even a tolerant arena for pluralism and civil society. Yet under this arrangement, key executive powers, including control over the security apparatus, the important decisions to be taken in, their, in the uh, economic arena, remain in the hands of unelected officials, and namely in this case, it would be the military. We do not witness, this is the other counterexample, we do not, do not witness such a deep state in Tunisia. And the reason may be for some obvious, for some obvious motifs. First, the Tunisian military was far more divorced from the old authoritarian order. Whereas in Egypt, the military has been the foundation of the state since 1950, 1952 to be more exact. Second, the Tunisian transition was far more abrupt and decisive with the entire ruling party, the RCD, discredited and most visible traces of the Ben Ali regime essentially eliminated from the political scene. Third, unlike Egypt, the old Tunisia was such a closed and repressive state that over the past year, we have witnessed an explosion of new parties and movements come to emerge to fill in the vacuum. Another of these actors I would like to talk about briefly and that came in with a lot of drama into the political scene is of course the Salafi movement. The Salafis have historically not been interested in democracy. Indeed, they have traditionally rejected participating in modern politics in favor of restoring a past, a golden past with all its mythology. And we must pay attention, very careful attention to the Salafis because as, most, as the most conservative element in the Islamist spectrum, they call for a traditional political order that seems anti-ethical to democracy and indeed to everything that's modern. The interesting thing, however, with this new development and with the coming of the Arab Spring is that many Salafi groups feel that they have no choice now but to enter into politics or become irrelevant. They have, in a sense, become rational political actors which accept the mundane world of politics. It's necessary. It's a necessary step to keep a voice to shape politics and to have some control over the state. This is why in Egypt they've decided to compete in the last elections. In Egypt and perhaps other Arab countries, they will now try to outbid the Muslim Brotherhoods and similar groups in the struggle for religious popularity. And without any doubt, they will do so by demanding the strictest of all interpretations of Sharia law. 
As a concrete example, for instance, they might impose their laws on street by attacking alcohol vendors or by trying to demand and by imposing a style of conservative dress over men and women. But they have little to say about material issues such as economic development, and they also have few tangible ideas about political institutions and economic arrangements. The slogan that Islam is a solution, which is their slogan, only gets us far, or so far. At some point, they must start producing viable answers for the basic social and economic questions which affect societies. In addition, the Salafi movements lack experience in the everyday work of democratic politics, electoral campaigning, mobilizing, and so forth. And they are no match for the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which commands an enormous social base. It commands highly centralized organization and has a lot of experience in networking and running for elections. Many Salafis take guidance in religious authorities and religious personalities which are uh, installed in Saudi Arabia and who know little about little or all close to nothing uh, to societies like Egypt. The Salafi movement, therefore, faces a fundamental dilemma, which will not allow it to realize its ultimate goals. Do the Salafis stay in politics and moderate their ideology in, war in order to win and survive elections, or do they play the radical role? of opposition by maintaining their extremely conservative views of society. Another important feature in this landscape is, of course, the struggle for the street. And Tunisia and Egypt today are also good cases of what define the potential political transitions of the Arab world will know in the future, and namely, the struggle or the control of the streets, Tahrir Square, Lu'lu'a Place, and so forth. The secular youth movements celebrated as the engines of this change in transitional settings like Tunisia and Egypt have not yet translated their popular force into political weight. Many of these youth movements neglected this hard task of organization building after they have succeeded in bringing about the revolution or leading it. For evidence, consider the Islamist parties won overwhelming victories in the first post-revolutionary elections in Tunisia and Egypt, even though they were not a major factor in these revolutions to begin with. They followed. In Egypt, as you well know, between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, it won three quarters of the 500 seat uh, uh, parliament in the last election. The primary reason for this was the massive campaigning and mobilization effort before voting. Simply put, these groups have become effective political machines. By contrast, Egypt's youth movement with the Shabab won just barely 10 seats in the new parliament. And at the same time, you see that the old regime has been discredited, the remnants of the old parties, along with the old left in both Tunisia and Egypt, performed very poorly in these elections. What these electoral dramas then show us is that at some point, political actors in favor of change must shift from the informal politics of protest and contestation to building organization and formal politics. Whether these youth movements have understood the lesson and whether or they are willing to organize in such a way and not cede political territory to the Islamists remains something to be seen. Of course, no discussion on the Arab Spring can uh, ignore uh, evoking the role of women. The question of who can win the street also implicates the question of the new political role for women in these countries. As you all know, as you've all seen on TV, women help drive the Arab Spring. Virtually every mid image of every protest features young women prominently fighting and demanding change alongside young men. In most countries, the current generation of young women has enjoyed greater gender equality in public life, greater access to jobs, greater access to resources than the previous generation. Everywhere in the public sphere and in politics, civil societies, universities, we see women playing larger roles. Nevertheless, we must be cautious in drawing quick analogies. This new generation of Arab female activists are not simply an extension of Western feminism as we know it in the West. 
To be sure, many Arab women demand greater participation in politics, as well as greater social equality and equality in general between the genders. However, they bring a unique cultural and social context to the struggle. Last December, we've seen both veiled and unveiled women stand together in demonstrations against police brutality affecting women. This has become a universal issue. Among Arab youth activists, both men and women share the common goals. One is to bring democracy. Secondly, is to institutionalize it rather than get stuck on one issue such as the veil. To be sure, the veil, as we understand it, is a Western obsession and more precis precisely a French one. <laughs> but remember that all politics is about action and reaction. If new Islamist group, the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafis try to, to use their, their, their victories in these new parliaments to impose more restrictions on women, then we may and we will see uh, a type of feminism that is uh, closer to the one we see here in, in the West. In any case, the cause of women is not dissociable from the democratic movement, and we should be aware of that. And on hindsight, it shows us how the old conventional thinking, which was very much pervasive in the West, and especially in France, that these authoritarian regimes, are, at the end of the day, are the best guarantee against the equality between men and women. We see how fallacious and how wrong that whole paradigm was. After all, Islamists came to power, and women still fight back. And that thinking didn't prevent the Islamists from making a political breakthrough. In the middle of this landscape, also, I want to talk about states of persistence. In contrasting with these struggles over the street, there are, there are places where substantial political change has not occurred, namely Morocco, Jordan, and most of the kingdoms in the Arab world. Morocco and Jordan run very strong parallels with each other. Both are resource-poor monarchies. Both have young populations, and both are staunch allies to the West. And in both kingdoms, large youth populations have mobilized for economic and political change in the stride of the Arab Spring and distinguished themselves from the old oppositions, whether Islamist or leftist. And in both kingdoms, the regimes responded with carefully designed liberalization processes whose central piece or central element was a reform of the Constitution giving a little bit more power to parliament, granting a little bit more freedom, but still keeping intact the powers of the central institution, which is the monarchy. And in both kingdoms, opposition movements and the youth remain unsatisfied with these limited changes. And the future remains uncertain as to whether this is a stable equilibrium or not. Elsewhere in the Arab world, Oil wealth has given some of the governments the means to appease populations with promises of jobs and economic development. Since early 2011, countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, the Emirates, and even Algeria announced massive multi-billion dollar increases in public salaries, food subsidies, education, and housing, and other public goods. Kuwaiti government, for, for instance, has given cash handout of $3,500 to every citizen. And they've referred to this or justified this by referring to the uh, surplus of the budget. Whether this uh, will, 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 at the end of the day, whether this will offset or uh, push back uh, uh, any, any demand for change, any uprising, or whether on the contrary it might incite it, remains to be seen, we have yet to say. But even in this context, some monarchies uh, in the Gulf, for instance, Kuwait uh, has known tribal movements, mobilizations over corruption, identity issues, and there are really, really uh, good indications believing that uh, the monarchy there is about to consider a historical compromise on some of the demands that the opposition has been formula formulating for decades. No discussion of the Arab Spring will be complete, of course, without evoking the economy. And while oil wealth makes the richest Gulf kingdoms unique, 
the rest of the Arab world deals with more common issues pertaining to economic development. The economy will determine the success or the failure of the democratically elected first governments of the Arab Spring in countries like Tunisia and Egypt. Democracy, as you know, and economic growth go hand in hand. Citizens are more willing to support a new democracy if they see improvement in living conditions, in their particular security, and their particular income. And indeed, it was the relative deprivation of many in the middle class in Tunisia and Egypt that provoked or that helped spark the demand for dignity, which was the catalyst of the Arab Spring. And keep in mind that the remnants of the old regime in the shade, still in the woodwork, uh, invoking or evoking the memory of the old regime, a memory of the old times under dictatorship where the country was exporting and where tourism came en masse. Therefore, we must be cautious about this reality. And in fact, this is precisely what many new competitive authoritarian regimes have done in the former communist world and former communist societies such as Russia in order to justify their rule and destroy the support for, for democracy because of the inherent link between uh, economic, uh, economic uh, regression and uh, precise or punctual uh, democratic openings. And this is price, precisely why among the first tasks of any transitional regime is to improve the material conditions of uh, these countries. Of the highest priority then is Tunisia and Egypt is the demand for jobs, as there is simply not enough employment to absorb a well-educated and young labor force. Yet one danger is that the public demand for jobs and welfare, which the state is expected to provide, may block the creation of a productive economy that is open to investment and supports a vibrant private sector. This is a potential contradiction and that Arab governments must resolve as it is an old legacy of governmental strategies practiced in the past decade that situate the, the state at the heart of the economic engine. Another critical issue, of course, is corruption, the perception of which among political fi figures and well-connected business elites have motivated the anger against the old authoritarian regimes. And here, transitional governments must therefore move forward and very fast in eliminating corrupt practices of the old state, such as financial abuse, nepotism, family connections, and encourage transparency in the economic decision uh, process, establishing clear laws that are open, that are open to everybody, and accountability. And as various observers of the World Bank to the United Nations have noted, the Arab world has enormous resources in terms of human capital or intellectual resources. Yet the riddle or the, the bottleneck here has always been how to achieve good governments in which responsible leaders can harness these endowments and generate strategies of sustainable long-term development which benefit all strata of society. And obviously, there is no magic formula. There is no recipe for prosperity. And we know that even the most successful of models can always crash. No Japan in the 1990s and the Western economies since uh, the late 2000s. Now, in this geography, there are also arenas of conflict. Elsewhere in the Arab world, civil conflict rages in varying intensity. Libya may be a case of a successful transition from violence, that is, violence and then quelling. But here, the absence of any state after the fall of Qaddafi means that various militias are fighting for control of the economy and for the nascent state institutions. Due to its very particular history and to the long domination of the Qaddafi regime over more than four decades, there is no deep state in Libya. The fact, this fact rather juxtaposed with the oil-based economy makes the creation of a central government even more arduous at present and in the future. And even more violent than Libya, you have Syria, where well over 6,000 people have been killed by this regime in the popular insurrection that began in, in, begun in, early, in 2011. The Syrian uprising is unique in this context 
whereas the mass uprising in Tunisia began in the periphery but went to the center of urban uh, areas, uh, the violence in Syria remains very much marginalized at the periphery, leaving uh, Damascus relatively, un relatively untouched until today. If uh, these, this uprising takes hold in Aleppo or Damascus, this may very well be a game changer. And we have yet to see, we see the beginnings of this. The Syri Syrian regime, as you know, under Bashar al-Assad, has shown little willingness to negotiate with the opposition for any type of transition. And by doing so, it has essentially created a zero-sum game. Either the regime wins through overwhelming repression and violence, and it's hard to see how that can happen, or else it sur surrenders power completely and sees its, uh, uh, its political order completely dismantled. And of course, there's another issue here, the sectarian dimension, which is very important. Because the minority Alawite community dominates key political and military posts, there is tangible fear that the collapse of regime will lead to kind of a reverse reprisals against this group in any new Syria. And at the same time, we have a problem with the Syrian opposition. It is fragmented. The Overseas Transitional Council struggles to maintain unity while internally most of the uprising remains unarmed. Yet there are also another element in this, uh, in this uh, 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 opposition framework is the growing defections in the Syrian army at lower levels. And we see daily signs that we are moving from a limited civil war to a full-blown one. The Syrian case brings in another very important dimension, namely the geopolitical dimension. And we must not forget, we must keep in mind at all times that a pivotal factor in the Libyan revolution or in the success of the Libyan revolution to overthrow Gaddafi was that NATO intervention, which all but eliminated the coercive capacity of the Gaddafi regime. But there will be no Western military intervention in Syria. Russia and China remain critical allies to the regime, and Western nations currently prefer the strategy of economic sanctions and democratic and diplomatic pressure. Even the Arab League's increasing isolation of Syria may not succeed in convincing the regime to step down. Elsewhere, the Western approach to regional change remains inconsistent. The constitutional reforms process in Morocco and Jordan, I think, in my opinion, are not the gateways to democratization, yet both have been applauded by the EU and the US as the ideal way to achieve democracy because they promise stability in an era of uncertainty and turmoil. The West thinks that it desperately seeks a success story. As another example, contrast the American threat to withdraw military aid from Egypt due to its crackdown on human rights groups this past February and the American decision to remain silent on the Bahraini government's crackdown on the democratic uh, movement there. This apparent contradiction reflects not just deference to the Arab League, but also the growing power, of course, of the GCC. I guess my point here on this geopolitical, uh, on this geopolitical uh, dimension is threefold. First, in all the transition experiences we've seen, whether Latin America, whether, whether Eastern Europe, whether Asia, we have not seen the outside world or the geopolitical or the external factor play such a big role in the transition. This is unprecedented. Uh, it's true, it was, it, was, it was traditionally and classically thought that most of the transitions happen due to internal factors proper to a society. And even if there are, or if there is an external factor, it plays usually in conjunction with internal factors, and it needs to find an internal pathway into the dynamics of the transition. For instance, uh, we, can talk, we can talk about the, uh, the, 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 the role of, of the Pope in, in the Polish transition uh, between uh, Solidarity and the Jaruzelski regime. 
it was a factor, but still here, we still can't weigh that factor. We can say also that the embargo uh, <clears throat> or the uh, uh, placing in quarantine of the apartheid regime played a role uh, in the coming to power of the ANC, ANC and the dismantling of, of apartheid. But here too, we still, it, it's minimal and it's, it's one factor among others. But here the internal factor seems to play a disproportionately very important and unprecedented role. The second thing I want you to retain <coughs> is that here uh, you have uh, essentially the West which has if you're floundering and discovering a strategy, it has no strategy, it discovers uh, uh, its tactics and its interests as the story unfolds in different contexts. And a corollary to this uh, Western weakness or the perception of Western weakness, you have uh, autonomy or you have the emergence of regional actors who are dictating their own agenda in this geopolitical context. Saudi Arabia is dictating its own agenda uh, in the region. Uh, Turkey is playing a more assertive role in the region. Iran is playing a more assertive role. And even a country which is not an Arab state like Israel is influencing in a way how these transitions are happening by threatening to strike Iran and so forth. So these are, if, if, there, are, if there are any conclusions I want you to remember about the geopolitical context is precisely that. Uh, I will end on that note, and I will take any of your questions. Thank you. In relation to the monarchy in Morocco, in your view, what should the status of the monarchy, monarchy be in the Constitution? Well, excuse me, could you, the last, uh, just the last phrase? Should it be a constitutional monarchy, and on what kind of role should the monarchy have in the Constitution? Uh, that question that question has <clears throat> led to not only my bonding with Santa Barbara, it's one of the reasons why I know my own type of friendly expulsion, as our own speaker would say, <laughs> from my, <laughs> from my, or I'd say from my country. Anyways, um, I, look, I don't think that uh, hereditary transmission of power and democracy, the only way these two realities can live together and can coexist peace peacefully is through a constitutional monarchy. Uh, eventually, the role, or eventually the role of the monarchy and the monarch should be one of national symbol, one of national uh, symbol of unity, one of arbiter of conflicts, and one that represents the perennity and the continuity of the nation and of the state. That's the ideal role of a monarch in a democratic con uh, context. Now the issue is not, is not, you know, is not whether we see this as, as being the ultimate ideal in the democratic context, but how do we, how do we reach that point? And uh, there are certain people that think that this, it's a tops down approach and there are others that feel, other political forces that feel that this is, cannot come alone. It's got to come through a, a process of imposition. Uh, where we are in a situation today where, the, where, where, where it's a dialectic, where it's an iterative process where both is happening. You have imposition from below and you have reaction from above. And you have these small steps towards constitutional monarchy, but we're far from them. And whether ultimately we will reach them by a process of by an, by a, by an open political crisis, or whether this small step process will happen, I do not know. It happened. It will depend on the interaction and the interplay of political forces on the ground. That's all I can say. 
I wanted to ask you maybe to elaborate a little bit or speculate a bit more on the Syrian context. I mean, particularly how um, you would suggest that people weigh in on this debate over intervention or you know non-intervention. And just I mean, and the reason you know I was thinking that Syria would clearly be a place where there would not be a Libya-style intervention, but today there's information coming out, at least allegations, that the regime is using chemical weapons now, or maybe deploying chemical weapons. And um, for example, Senator John McCain the other day was just advocating, if not the United States, at least other countries militarily arming uh, the opposition. So just wondering if you might reflect a little bit on the, the liabilities or the possibilities um, of even thinking about some kind of intervention or, or interventions. Well. If you ask the, the, Syrian, the Syrian, all the components of the Syrian opposition, they are clearly not against, not, do not want an intervention. What they want is some kind of humanitarian corridors to help, uh, to help civilians and to ensure that, that uh, to protect civilian uh, populations. Uh, Everybody is very suspicious, and especially in Syria, and the uh, uh, and the, the the trauma of Iraq, and what intervention has led in Iraq, is extremely serious in uh, uh, among the Syrians. And as a related note to that, people in the region and in Syria would be very suspicious about something Senator McCain or a political figure would say, because at the end of the day, it's not about protecting Syrians or maybe protecting Syrians, but at the end of the day, it's about pacifying the future Syria for some other geopolitical uh, uh, goal, and we know what that goal is. Uh, uh, so you ask anybody, they'll tell you, yes, we want, uh, we want help, but we do not want intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, what is crucial and what can go uh, uh, a long way to help is showing the Syrian regime that it has no way out but to, to plot a course for itself where it has to exit the scene. And the more it delays, the more it will be costly for it, for the elites, for the people that stay behind. And this, if, if, if the impunity is removed, and if the Syrians know that they've got nowhere to hide, the Syrian regime has nowhere to hide, that no, no Russian veto, no Chinese veto will help. I think that will be that will be crucial. That will 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 bring it to the table, because at the end of the day, this regime has lost all pretension for hegemony over the society in the future, and frankly, at this point, for even being able to uh, to conduct politics afterwards. I mean, Chile. Pinochet left the Chilean, uh, the Chilean scene think, knowing that he may come back, or at least if not him, he or somebody from that elite will come back. These people have put themselves in a situation where there's not, no coming back. And they've put themselves in this situation, not because people did, didn't give him an exit route. They gave him plenty of possibilities. The Observer mission, the Arab League mission mandate, all these were elaborate schemes to give them a face saving uh, way out. But there is, this regime has put itself in a situation, and in fact, where many inside this regime are saying, look, the only way we can stay or we can win some time is killing as many people as we can. And that's what, that's the strategy, of, that's where they put themselves uh, in. And for decent, patriotic, peace-loving Alawites of that community, this is the tragedy they're going to have to live with because some caste of thugs led by Bashar al-Assad put them in that situation. I am from Pakistan, and uh, like uh, I've been really motivated by the Arab Spring. But nevertheless, being from Pakistan and being raised there, I, can st uh, I still realize the fact that you can have a parliamentary democracy in a third world country, which is still like more or less subservient to imperialist interests. And the fact is that like there is actually practically no democracy, but there is like a very formal, nominal, hollow form of democracy, which makes me realize that actually just vying for simply parliamentary democracy in Arab countries, which are dictatorships today, is somewhat of a futile 
manner of like uh, gaining independence. And given the fact that many authoritarian Arab countries uh, have been backed by like uh, the imperialist triad, NATO countries, whatnot, uh, to me it personally seems like you need to have some sort of anti capitalist, anti-imperialist option to de-link from like, a world which is highly unequal and will impress imperialism upon or superimpose it upon countries which might even have a parliamentary democracy. And you did not really address that in your thoughts. I was just um, curious to know what your thoughts would be on uh, a form of governance which would be truly like anti-imperialist, would, and it would actually represent the, the community uh, or the communities represented uh, supposedly by the parliament today in countries like Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, that's a very important question, but there is a geopolitical dimension in this area of the world. There is oil. It's a very big one. There is uh, Israel, and it's a very big one. And when I say Israel, I do not say, I'm, I do not mean the right of Israel to exist in peace. I think that ought to be something which should be guaranteed to it. I'm talking about the uh, 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 old Zionist dream of the larger Israel, which has not been abandoned. It's been abandoned in name, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. And it's called Oslo, and it's called all these things. And the, 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 the insistence of the United States to support, or not the whole United States, just the beltway, to support that dream or to not disavow it. And the lack of vision on a part of Europe to follow that. This is a geopolitical dimension. This is a geopolitical constraint that we're going to have to live with for a long time. And it's going to be there. And it's going to exercise all sorts of influences on the local areas and on strategic states, like Egypt. We know that. But we have to deal with it. You have a point. One of the reasons why uh, 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 the military in Egypt feels so emboldened is because of that dimension. Because at the end of the day, the United States is not going to give, uh, is not going to give the Muslim Brotherhoods $1.5 billion of aid. It's going to give the Egyptian army that. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfectly fair question, and that is the case. But we can't ignore that. We have to, we have to live with that. And just because that's a reality, saying, well, you know, uh, we have to abandon democracy for all, no. We have to live with that. We have to put it in its perspective. And if anything, the part of the Arab Spring is also uh, uh, the right, to, is, is partially an effort to recuperate dignity. And dignity was about breaking these, this uh, authoritarian pacts that were done with the outside because of petroleum, because of all these arrangements. So it's not as if the citizenry have not, re have not reacted against it. They have reacted against that. And they are trying to address it. So yes, you're right. But no, it's not a fatality. We don't have to, we don't have to, uh, uh, to live with that forever. And the comparison with Pakistan is a little bit is difficult, because though there is that in your own country, there is that geo geopolitical. Uh, uh, constraint because of the Taliban and Afghanistan connection, a lot of the problems in Pakistan are due, in fact, to a to uh, to the to the founding of the nationhood moment, when we didn't define what it means to be Pakistani. Was it was it to be Pakistani? Was it did it mean the ideals of Ali Muhammad, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, or it means? Uh, uh, the ideology of uh, Maududi. And what about all these elites which were supposed to lead the country out? They have created ethno, uh, 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 ethnic based cliques which have essentially uh, sapped democracy in any effort and have invited the military to come in every time. Uh, so it's not a clear equation. I'm saying there, there is this geopolitical constraint, but there's also internal. And people can shape it through agency. That's, that's my point. I wanted to know your thoughts a little bit about hopes for change and social um, movements within Saudi Arabia. Because I think Saudi Arabia seems to be something that we have trouble imagining as a very dynamic place, but it has a long history of, of labor movements, has millions of people, Saudi city and citizens themselves, that are poor and that are organized and that have made demands. And Saudi Arabia is, is such a, an important 
weight now in, in the Lebanese political system, in the Syrian funding of certain groups, in, in the Palestinian equation, and, and everywhere. Um, but you know, we tend to represent it still as the decisions of, of the king or of the mischief of the carbon molecule, as Timothy Mitchell would put it, and, and Saudi Arabia's sweet crude oil being the most mischievous carbon molecules that seems to screw up politics for the country. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can think more dynamically, particularly about Saudi Arabia, because I think that would be really helpful and, and, and have a vast kind of impact if we could even just start to think of it differently a little bit. The problem the Saudi Arabian government uh, uh, spent $140 billion or announced it will pay $140 billion. That's a very large sum. And in these conditions, I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, you can, you can win time, you can buy social peace. But for how long, that remains a story. Also, that remains a real question. Uh, we tend to look at, at, at Saudi Arabia or in the West, well, you know, Muslim fundamentalism and so forth, but you have to understand there's a vibrant middle class. And the engine of that middle class was just the, the, the distribution of, 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 uh, of, oil wealth, of, of oil welfare. But there also, you know, with oil comes rents. And there is also a, 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 a reality that comes with rents. It's people are co-opted. People are conditioned. You have enormous organizations, enormous uh, uh, administration, uh, you know, capability, which crowds out everything else. Um, labor movements, you know. I still have to know it. what does it mean? Are there any labor movements in Saudi Arabia? There's a lot of labor, there's a lot of inequality, but are there any labor movements? Uh, in Morocco or Jordan, these monarchies, you, had, uh, you have uh, civil societies as such. In Saudi Arabia, you don't have a civil society as such. You don't have, uh, you, you, have you have organizations doing the work of civil society, but you wouldn't have a, you know, a critical mass of a nucleus you call uh, uh, civil society. So all all of this is is to be, of course, is to be, of course, uh, uh, factored in. And you have also. Uh, I had I have a sense when I talk to people in the elite in Saudi Arabia that they're not any different than anybody than everybody else in the in the Arab world. But they have a sense that their time is coming and they can wait also for uh, another generation of leadership uh, in power which can facilitate things. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a, complex, it's a complex equation, and, and it's, it's hard to say which of these parameters will be the most, uh, the, 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 the heavier in the equation. Our final question. What does the world do about the chemical stockpiles in Syria? Ask Richard. <laughs> no, 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 no. Either of you can answer. Uh, 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 well, it's not, it's not so much a question about the about the Arab Spring, but I, in terms of the Arab Spring, how would I suggest it? How would I uh, address that question? Well, if we were to elect, if we were to have democratically elected governments then we can be in a situation where we can have a stabler Middle East. And if we have a stabler Middle East, then we can talk about how to dispose and how to link everybody into a multilateral regime where we can trade off security, legitimate security concerns of everybody with the capacity everybody has and the technology everybody has. But these are rules that will have to apply to everybody. We cannot be uh, ferociously going after Iran and neglect Israel. Although I, will, I am uncomfortable, I am uncomfortable with a, an Iranian regime having nuclear bomb. But I can understand why such a regime would go after getting a weaponized nuclear capacity because of a certain foreign policy by the West it perceives as unjust and self-serving. And at the same time, 
if I can, if, if there is a regime by which everybody, this, the same laws apply to everybody, I would, I would, I would certainly feel that the, uh, the arguments and the pressures applied to a certain member of that community to abide by certain laws would be more effective. Uh, so linking this to the Arab Spring, this is a potential of the Arab Spring to creating a more prosperous, stable, and, and, uh, and safe uh, Middle East for, for a more uh, in-depth analysis of that. What does the world do about the chemical stockpiles in Syria? It's not so much a question about the, about the Arab Spring, but I, in terms of the Arab Spring, how would I suggest it, how would I uh, address that question? Well, if we were to elect, if we were to have democratically elected governments, then we can be in a situation where we can have a stable Middle East. If we have a stable Middle East, then we can talk about how to dispose and how to link everybody into a multilateral regime where we can trade off security, legitimate security concerns of everybody with the capacity everybody has and the technology everybody has. But these are rules that will have to apply to everybody. We cannot be uh, ferociously going after Iran and neglect Israel. Although I, will, I am uncomfortable, I am uncomfortable with a, an Iranian regime having nuclear bomb. But I can understand why such a regime would go after getting a weaponized nuclear capacity because of a certain foreign policy by the West it perceives as unjust and self-serving. And at the same time, if I can, if, if there is a regime by which everybody, this, the same laws apply to everybody, I would, I would, I would certainly feel that the, uh, the arguments and the pressures applied to a certain member of that community to abide by certain laws would be more effective. Uh, so linking this to the Arab Spring, this is a potential of the Arab Spring to creating a more prosperous, stable, and, and, uh, and safe uh, Middle East. For